There is no other king like Jesus. Happy Easter Restoration Church. Um, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here. If you are new, I'm easily excitable. So if uh, whoever brought you this morning did not warn you about that, I apologize in advance. But uh, today is a big day. And I'm even more excited today, not because you're here, don't take that personally. I'm excited because what today represents. Today is the day that we remember what Jesus did for us. He was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Today is a big day. See, nations will come and go. Leaders don't last. Everything changes. But there is one thing that does not change. There is one message that does not change today. The church global around the world, Christians around the world, everyone is preaching the same message. Everyone is focused on one thing, and that one thing is the empty tomb. There is more books being written about Jesus there are more songs, there are more messages than anyone in all of history. Today, a few billion people here on this planet will worship him. Why? Because he is king. There is no other king. In a world consumed with the concept of power, there is no one else more powerful. In a world consumed with authority, he is the ultimate authority. In a world consumed with position and title, there is no position or title that is higher than his. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the prince of peace. He is the mighty God, wonderful counselor, everlasting father. In your darkest moment, he is there. When you're on top of the world, he is there. He's the one that knows you best and still loves you most. He, he knows you and he loves you. He, he, he is creator. He is also sustainer. But better yet, he is savior. We're talking about our king today. He wasn't voted in. And he can't be voted out. He always was and always will be. He created time, but yet stands outside of it. He died on the cross, but rose from the grave. We rebelled, yet he saved. I'm talking about our king this morning. But before he took his place on an earthly throne, he wants to be the king of your heart this morning. I'm talking about our king today, the one true king who always was, who always is, and always will be. See, it's Easter Sunday. And that's a very, very big deal. And, and if you grew up in church, you know the story. But sometimes we, we get so caught up in the, in the children's version of the story that, that we miss the, the simplicity, yes. But we, we miss the big picture of, of what this day is all about. See, if we forget who we used to be, then we won't worship our king the way we should. See, sometimes we forget that sin separated us from God. It was sin as our rebellion, us doing things our way. God, God makes the rule and says, hey, here's how I want you to live. Here's how I want you to do it. This is what you should do. And we say, God, no, no, no. I know better than you. I'm going to live my life my way and do my thing. And so when we sin, when we rebel, we, we miss the target. We, we miss the mark. You might say, but Scott, why does God get to make the rules? Did you miss the part about him being king? Like he is king. He's in charge. He, he gets to miss the rule. He gets to make the rules. See, we live in a country that is not a kingdom. We have a, we have a republic democracy where we, we are, we're governed by laws and we, and we get to vote. And, and we like that that we get to vote because we get the illusion of choice sometimes. You caught that. <laughs> 
And so here, here, here we are, we, we have this voice, we get, a, we, get a, we get a cast a ballot. So we, we think sometimes when it comes to God that, that we get to tell him what we think and we get, to, we get to go, well, God, I really don't like that. How about we change that? How, here's a petition, God. And God says, no, I am king. What's so interesting, here we are a country that is not a kingdom, but yet we are still consumed with that concept. Look at our kids' movies and books. How many of our kids' movies and books are about kings and queens and kingdoms? We are are consumed about it. In chess, we protect the king. In checkers, we get to the other side and we say, king me. And that's really the question today. That really is the battle going on. Who is king? Who is queen? Am I the king of my own life? Or is he? See, let me tell you about my king today. Jesus is the central figure of all of human history. His crucifixion and resurrection are the most crucial events in all of time. Some have said that our redemption via the crucifixion and resurrection is more marvelous than creation itself. Think about that. It's more amazing than God's even creating everything. See, because creation was an act of power and wisdom. Salvation was all of that plus love, mercy, and grace. So when we look at our world, every single leader in our world has shortcomings. Every single leader in all of history makes mistakes, except for one, Jesus Jesus was perfect. He was innocent. And yet he paid our debt. He paid, he paid my debt and your debt. If you have debt this morning and someone offered to pay your debt, would that be a good thing? Some liars in church. Would that be a good thing if someone wanted to pay your debt today? Yes, it would be a good thing. You'd probably get excited about that. If I said, hey, I've got some money. I want to pay your debt. You would say, hey, here, Scott, here's all of my debt. You pay my debt. And here's Jesus. We have this debt that we could not pay. And he doesn't lord it over us. He doesn't, he doesn't put us in a prison because of it. He pays it for us. See, Jesus was and is God. Now, I know in our culture today, we try to be intellectual and we say things that are, that are kind of silly. We go, well, I believe that there was a man named Jesus. <laughs> and we say that because if we've studied at all, we realize that there's so much evidence that he lived and that he died and that he even rose again that we don't really, we don't want to, we don't want to debate that. So we go, well, I believe in a man named Jesus. I just don't believe that he was God, he was a good man. Some would say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I believe he was a prophet. Okay, now let me me paint this scenario for you. If I showed up to church this morning and I said, hey guys, guess what? I'm God. I'm God. Me, I'm God in the flesh. Would you leave church today and go to lunch and say, that Scott's a good guy? Would you say, man, that Scott, he must be a prophet? Or would you say, that Scott is crazy? (laughs) Some of you already say that. That Scott has lost his mind. He thinks he is God. If someone claims to be God and they are not, you don't say they're a good guy, you don't say that they're a prophet. You say they are a lunatic and a liar. The reason why they don't say that is because he was God and is God. And he said that about himself. If you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible or an app on your phone or your tablet, there is a Bible in the seat back in front of you. You can keep that as a gift from us to you. At Restoration Church, we are Bible people. We believe this is the Word of God. We don't hide that. We're not ashamed of that. We believe these are the words of God, so we like to walk through the Bible. So if you're turning, there's the right-hand side of your Bible. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 6, verse number 38. When you got it, say got it. 
says this, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of, the, of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that has been given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? He do, he do, how does he now say that I have come down from heaven? See, Jesus isn't claiming to be a good dude. Jesus is saying, I came from heaven. Who lives in heaven? Not a trick question. God does. He says, I, I came, I'm, I'm God in the flesh, I am the bread of life. See, Jesus is a game changer. Jesus dying for my sins and yours changed everything. See, at, when God made the world, everything was perfect. There was no sin, there was no disease, there was no hurt, there was no pain. But then sin entered the world. Adam and Eve rebelled against God and said, God, yeah, yeah, you made a standard, you made a way, but we know better. So we're going to do our own thing. When sin entered the world, now death entered the world and pain entered the world and all this junk entered the world, sin changed everything and someone had to pay for that debt and Jesus says I will come and I will shed my blood on the cross for the sins of all mankind to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead that fact changes everything seriously who does that who calls their shot says I'm gonna die but just wait a couple days I'm gonna get up who does that the king does See, Jesus does what no other person in history, the history of the world could do, dies innocent for the guilty, then raises from the dead. See, Jesus changed the history of the world. You might say there has been a lot of people who have changed the world. Scott, uh, I watch the news. I watch, I, I go to I have a history class. I, 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 there's a lot of people who have changed the world not like Jesus. You can look at Buddha. Oh, Buddha, Buddha changed a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. But Buddha, Buddha was cremated when he died. And guess what? We can go to his grave today because he is still there. His body is. Muhammad. Oh, oh, oh Muhammad, he, he changed the whole area. Yeah, guess what, though? I can go to Medina where people go every single year to his tomb where his body still is. He did not raise Abraham, the founder of Judaism. Good guy, did good things. But guess what? When he died, his body is still there. It did not raise, did not raise Joseph Smith, not such a good dude, who started the, the, the Muslim faith, the Mormon faith. You know, guess what? He, 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 yeah, he, people are following him and people are, are, are trying to believe in what he said, but I can go to his place where he died and his body is still there. He did not raise from the dead. If we go to Jesus' tomb, guess what we'll see? We'll see this place that looks more like a museum. And they'll say things like this. Well, here's an empty tomb and we think this is where Jesus was put. They don't say that about any other leader. They say that about Jesus. Why? Because he wasn't there very long. <laughs> like, like we, we think that's the place. We think that's the spot. We're not sure because he wasn't there but a couple of days. And so we, we think this is where he was. See, Jesus is the only one who has done that. And see, some of you grew up in church and you're like, yeah, yeah, Scott, I know the story, but do you really? Do you really know the story? And if you didn't grow up in church, I want to tell you the story. I want to take a few moments and, and read the story to you. That way we can see what the story itself says. So in your Bibles, go a little bit more to your right to John chapter 20. You were in John chapter 6. I'll go to chapter 20. That's the big number. And there's a small number in chapter, verse 1. That's where we're going to start. John 20, verse 1, here is the story of the resurrection. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Now stop real quick. Uh, one of the things that I love about the Bible is this. The Bible is honest. 
even with people who, who aren't always perfect. Did you see? Now, now there's two disciples here. It's, it's Peter and there's another guy. This was written by John, okay? The other disciple here is John himself. And what does he say about himself? There was Peter and then the disciple that Jesus loved. <laughs> See, I, John's a little prideful. John's like, yeah, 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 I was with Peter. Mary was there, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> uh, the one that Jesus, that's what he said, the one that Jesus loved. and said to him, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we did not know where they had laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, that's John, and they, and they were going toward the tomb. Get this, look at verse 4. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. You think John's a little competitive. Th that's how I am. I, I, seriously, if we're driving someplace, you might not know it, but we are racing there. <laughs> We are racing. You don't know it, but you're losing because we are racing there. If, if, we're, if we're running on a track, you might think you're just jogging. I'm not jogging. I'm trying to beat you. Like, I, I'm trying to catch you. I'm trying to beat you. I'm trying to win. And I feel better because I'm like John. And Jesus loved John. John said it himself. <laughs> So John's saying, look, Peter and I are running to the tomb, but I'm faster than Peter because I beat him to the tomb. Do you think Peter read that and was happy? He's like, John, you sucker. <laughs> and stooping to look in, verse 5, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth, which, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. I wish I had time to talk about that real quick. But just to give you a quick little picture, when in the Jewish culture, if you were, were going to come back to your table, you would fold your cloth nicely and put it there. It means I'm coming back. Jesus' faith cloth, face cloth was folded up nicely and put separately. Why? Because he's coming back. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing to be him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went out, went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And he said these things to her. Verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the door is being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them. Don't miss that. The doors were locked. Nobody could get in. But Jesus just walked in and stood among them and said, peace be with you. When he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now, let's look at this account rationally for a second. Let's try to, let's try to look at it a little more scientifically. Let's, let's, let's kind of dissect this account of what happened with his resurrection. So here's what happened. So the, the tomb, the stones rolled away. And who was the first person at the tomb? Mary. 
Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. Now, it might not be significant to you because here we live in Wichita, Kansas in 2019. And so we live in a different culture, different place, a different part of the world. But back in, back in this place of the world, in this time frame, women did not have the same rights as men. Their testimony was not the same as a man's testimony in court or anywhere else. See, I want you to see something. God, God turns culture upside down. When we mess things up, he comes and fixes things. So the first person to the tomb was a woman. Why? Because God says, hey, look, I don't care what culture says. I'm going to fix this. I made woman, and I made her awesome, and I made her beautiful, and I made her smart, and I'm going to use her to be the first person to see my empty tomb. And here's what Celsius said. An early Greek philosopher in the second century, he actually hated Christians. Here's what he said about the, 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 res, the resurrection account. He says, how can any man listen to the testimony of a hysterical female? See, that's, what they view, that's how they viewed women back then. Now, let's just assume that Celsius' wife was not a very happy woman living with this man, talking about her like that. But that's, that's how women's testimonies were. So people were saying, well, what, why, how can you trust a woman's testimony? So let's think about it rationally for a second. If the disciples were trying to make up a story, if they were, if they were stealing his body, why would they use a woman to be the first firsthand account? They wouldn't. They wouldn't because in that culture, her, her word didn't mean anything. But I love what Paul says about the resurrection the witness, and the witnesses to the resurrection. I'm not going to have you turn to it because we just studied a couple of months ago. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 9, here's what Paul says. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Caiaphas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers others at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, look, it's not just Mary, it's not just the disciples, there's actually 500 first-hand accounts. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't just hang out for a day or two. He was there for 40 days before he sent it to heaven. And he's showing up and showing people, guess what? I'm back. Can you imagine how fun that would be? You thought I was dead. I'm back. Now, I would have some fun with that if I was Jesus. Now, I'm a little bit weird. And some of you are like, yeah, yeah, we know you're a little bit weird. But actually on my computer, my wife knows there's a, there's a folder and I have it on a, on a separate drive as well. And it says Scott's funeral, just in case something ever happens to me. And I, and I, have, I have videos for all the major days of my kid's life that, I, that I've already made. That way if something happens, I can still be a part of those major days of their life. And then I have this, this, this video that's for my funeral. And if you didn't know this about me, some of you already do, but I plan on preaching my own funeral. <sighs> Something like control freak. No, it's not so much that. But there'll be people that will come to my funeral who will never come to church. People in my family who don't know Jesus, who won't come to church, but will come to my funeral. And they might not listen to the pastor who is preaching, but they better listen to me that day. <laughs> it's my funeral. And I start off the video like this. I, I was thinking, how do you start this video? Like, what, what, does, what does the past say? Let's hear from Scott this morning. Is that what they do? And so I just, I had it in my mind where the pastor just goes, okay, and he reads the thing, and all of a sudden the video pops up. And here's what I say. Hey! I, get, I bet you didn't think you would hear from me today. Like, that's exactly... <laughs> if you outlive me, you'll see the video someday. And I'm like, hey, so don't be afraid when you see it. I'm like, hey, I bet you didn't think you're here from me today. And, and I, I got like a little bit of a joy doing that part of the video, to be honest. And I can just imagine Jesus walking around, hey, 
hey, I bet you didn't think you would see me today. Like, whoa, Jesus. And, and Paul's saying over 500 men saw him like that, and most of them are still alive. You can go and talk to them. You can ask them questions. They'll tell you all about him because they saw him. If this was a court case, and we were to bring all these eyewitnesses, saying, yeah, I saw him. Yeah, I saw him. I saw him over here. I saw him over there. Man, I, didn't, I don't even know you. I don't know you, but I saw him. I saw him. If everybody's saying they saw him, at some point you've got to say, man, this guy is alive. And you've got to picture this. You've got to understand this. When he died, the disciples scattered. They were afraid. Some of them denied him. What brought them back together? The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I mean, who can raise from the dead? Only the king. Let's get back to our text. I'm going to go quickly. Back to chapter 20, verse 4 of John. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. I still love that part. And reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in one place by itself. Now, when John is writing about what Peter saw, I want you to notice something. You're not going to get it, understand it in our Bible because it's written in English. But he, the, the typical word in the Greek for, for seeing something, for, 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 for he, he saw, would be the word blepo. That means he saw, that means he sees. But John doesn't use that word to describe what Peter saw. He uses the word theoreo, which means this, don't miss it, to observe, to look intently for an explanation. So Peter walks in second, <laughs> and he looks. Where is he at? What? This doesn't make any sense. Where's the body? Wait, there's linen clothes lying here? If, if somebody stole the body, why would they leave the linen here? See, the linen had spices on it that were very, very expensive, and, and they would actually make the body smell good. And he's like, so somebody would leave basically money laying in the tomb, and they're going to take a smelly, bloody, dead body out? Why wouldn't they leave him wrapped up? And he's looking intently for an explanation. He's, he's trying to figure this out. If somebody stole him, this doesn't make sense. Do you know what makes sense? That Jesus is who he said he was, and he rose from the dead. But Scott, how could he do that? Are you not listening? He's creator. He is king. You know what doesn't make sense? that Jesus would take my place. What doesn't make sense is that he would take your place. It doesn't make sense that here he is innocent, and here I am, a person who rebelled against him. There was punishment, and Jesus says, ah, I'll take this one. That doesn't make sense sense. But grace doesn't make sense. Because grace is getting what I don't deserve and not getting what I do deserve. See, here's the bottom line. And I love how Paul says it when he writes to the church in Ephesus. So instead of me trying to explain to you salvation, I'm going to want to read you what Paul says because it's so awesome. Ephesians 2 verse 1, he says, and you were dead in the, and you who were dead in your trespasses and your sins. Dead, not sick. Like right now I've got allergies that are kicking my tail. But guess what? I'm going to get better. He didn't say you had the flu, you had allergies. He says you were dead, no hope in your trespasses and sin in which you, want, in which you once walked 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love in, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of works. You can't do anything to earn it so that no one could boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk them out. If you do not know Jesus this morning, you are dead in your sin. You can't fix it. You can't do enough good. You can't come to church enough. You can't give enough money. You are dead. But God, being rich in mercy and grace, sent Jesus to take your place. Well, well, how do I get saved? Grace through faith. You confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is who he said he was. Who did he say he was? He said he was God in the flesh. You believe that he rose from the dead, which he did. You repent of your sins. Say, God, I, I am so sorry, man. I've blown it. I, forgive me. I'm going to stop living for myself. Be the Lord of my life. You be the king of my life. And in that moment, he saves you. But Scott, that seems too easy. <laughs> Don't worry. Living it out isn't. <laughs> But God made you coming to life easy because he loves you and he did it for you. If you're here today and you do know him, but there are areas of your life where you have taken back control. And you said, I want to be the king of this. I want to be the queen of this. I want to be in charge. Today, maybe this Easter Sunday, we can look at our life and say, God, I don't know better than you. You be the one in charge. I surrender all. Let's pray. God, I thank you this morning for loving us. <laughs> it's amazing to think about the price you paid so that we could be alive. God, I pray if there is anybody here today who does not yet know you or is watching online, I pray that right now they would confess and say, Jesus, you are God. You rose from the dead. Forgive me of my sin. I repent. Be the Lord of my life. You be in charge. I surrender everything to you. And in this moment, transform them from death into life. And God, I pray for those in here today that do know you. God, we just wrestle with who's in charge. We want to do our thing all the time. God, I pray that we would understand how much you love us. We'd understand who you are. You are king. You see all. You know all. So 
so your way is better than ours. Our way brings hurt and pain. Your way brings restoration and grace. Help us to follow you. God, sometimes we overcomplicate things. Easter's simple. <laughs> Not for you, but for us. I pray that we would put our faith and trust in you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you move at all, if you gave your life to Jesus this morning, in your bulletin is a little tear-off sheet right here. If you would tear this off and write your name and your information, there's a little check box as I accepted Christ. If you would just go out these doors to the information table once we sing one last song and give that to them, somebody will contact you this week. So we have a thing here called personal trainers. Sometimes you can show up to church and you feel like it, I, I don't understand what everybody's doing. I don't understand what all this means. Kind of like going to the gym for the first time. Like I see all the equipment. I know I need it, but I don't know how. So you get a personal trainer to walk with you how to lift the weights, how to eat the food you should eat, how, how, how to balance your workout we want to give you the personal trainer to figure out how to pray. What does salvation mean? How do you read the Bible? Now what? Maybe you're, you have been saved, but you're new in your faith. And you would like a trainer. There's also a box that says, I am interested in a PT. See, look, we're not just trying to go through the motions or have nice services. We want to follow the king. We want to live our faith out. See, Easter is not a religious day. It's a God day. We we'll remember what he did. If you stand on your feet, but see this one last song, which I think just is a perfect picture of what Jesus did and what this day is about. Would you sing with us this morning?